psychological model of analysis. So we wanted to look at the different kind of layers and the different ecological context through which these um, barriers were functioning. So at the individual level, we identified, um, you know, a lot of economic resource issues. So these folks are just experiencing poverty um, and they have a lot of economic resource, you know, related barriers to exiting homelessness and gaining housing. Um, additionally, they had a lot of criminal justice system involvement, which certainly relates to their economic issues. You know, folks continuously have to check a box, um, noting that they have criminal justice involvement, which can prevent them from obtaining both employment and housing opportunities. And there were also health factors that were identified. So folks um, were really experiencing, you know, chronic health conditions, disabilities, and things like that, that prevented them from um, gaining employment and, and things like that. At the interpersonal level, we found that folks were reporting a lack of social support. So they, you know, didn't have familial support. They didn't have support from other uh, friends or loved ones. And the support that they did have uh, was equally under-resourced. So a lot of the support that folks were reporting were actually other shelter stayers or um, service providers. Um, and then additionally, folks were also reporting just a mistrust of the systems meant to serve them. Um, so maybe they had, you know, previous negative experiences with uh, different systems, and that really prevented them from, you know, kind of getting the most out of the systems that are there to serve them. At the community level, there's just a lack of affordable housing, and the location of that affordable housing is problematic. So the areas that people need to live that's, you know, close to the resources, um, community-based resources that they rely upon, um, they're just not able to find affordable housing in those locations. Additionally, um, this was very much um, sort of nuanced and contextualized by uh, race and segregation here in Chicago. So, for example, folks talked about um, how they had previous experience in a gang, which maybe led to incarceration. And now, you know, they haven't been gang affiliated or involved for years and years. But the, you know, location of affordable housing or the location of housing that they're, you know, trying to be placed in um, is in areas where they're not safe to live. Um, so they really need, you know, a wider array of options. And then this was also kind of nuanced by gentrification and how this might affect uh, rising costs within certain communities over others. And at the systems level, you know, there were institutional policies that were really restrictive and prohibitive and, and caused additional problems for people. Um, and these systems sort of prevented pro uh, providers from actually helping folks. I mentioned the lack of affordable housing and, and some of the nuances there, just a kind of lack of options. And then finally, there was a lack of transparency in these systems built to serve individuals experiencing homelessness. And so, you know, providers weren't able to answer questions and coupled with this mistrust um, just creates a really challenging system for folks to navigate this very, very complex service system. So to wrap it up here, um, I know I need to wrap it up in maybe one minute or so. We were really happy and excited to elevate the voices of long-term shelter stayers in this project. Um, I just want to bring home kind of the economic issues and just general poverty that folks are experiencing and how health-related issues, mass incarceration, and other types of issues might be exacerbating that poverty. Um, and then, you know, there were lots of other key considerations that you might look into um, if you're able to zoom in on our poster, but just some recommendations that I'll leave you with. Um, we really feel that this uh, particular subpopulation of folks experiencing chronic homelessness, they need wraparound service programs to address, you know, all of these different health, economic, and housing goals. Um, I think it's important to note that despite all of these barriers, this population still reported goals to obtain housing. Um, so that's still a goal that they need supported. Um, you know, we need more affordable housing options and they need to be located in safe neighborhoods with um, economic opportunities that folks can live in, you know, more options. And given, you know, the level of vulnerability for this particular population, um, it may be indicated to actually prioritize this subpopulation to be housed first. Um, and then just improving transparency in this overall system to, to help serve this population. So I will end it there. Thanks Thank so much. Thank you, Tony. Thank you very much. Thanks, Camilla. Uh, next, we have Mary, uh, an, an explanatory analysis of critical motivation in over uh, mentoring setting. 
So our project looked at critical motivation scores across different demographic groups in a sample of students from DePaul University and various public elementary schools in Chicago. Um, our participants were part of a research-based mentoring program to provide students with community-oriented interventions to lessen the effects of stress. So critical consciousness represents marginalized or oppressed people's analysis of societal inequities and their motivations and actions to redress these inequities. It's broken down into three components, critical reflection, critical motivation, and critical action. Critical reflection represents the process of learning to question the social arrangements and structures that marginalize groups of people. Critical motivation represents someone's perceived capacity and commitment to addressing these perceived injustices. And critical action represents engaging to change the perceived injustices. Um, the demographic factors we chose to include in this study were gender, race and ethnicity, and immigration status. Um, our sample was 67% female and 32% male. 90% um, of our participants were born in the US and 42% of our participants were black or African American. Our results showed that there were no significant differences between the different demographics within the mentee and mentor subsamples, but there was a significant difference in critical motivation between the mentees and the mentors where mentors had significantly higher critical motivation than the mentees. Um, critical motivation has been theorized to mediate the relationship between critical reflection and critical action. Um, in general, critical reflection is thought to be high among underrepresented students participating in empowerment-oriented interventions like this mentoring program, while levels of critical action are typically low. So our results suggest that mentors might be able to foster increased critical motivation in mentees, which might help increase critical action by default. Future research should further explore this relationship between critical reflection and critical action, as well as the role that critical motivation plays as a mediator. Future research should also explore the effects of mentoring on critical motivation so that we can see if mentors are able to foster increased critical motivation in mentees. Thank you. Uh, are you done? Yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That was fast. Uh, next, uh, we have um, student experience with introduction to community psychology, beginning as an agent of um, change. Ted's book. Ted, are you I'm here? here? Yes, sir. All right. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to try to just speed through this because there's a lot of information here. But um, I did this poster on a project we were doing, an evaluation of the new free Introduction to Community Psychology, Becoming an Agent of Change textbook. Um, this was tailored for undergraduate students, uh, but it can also be used by anyone in the field um, to learn more about uh, what community psychologists do, how it started, and all the ins and outs and the things we address throughout um, our careers. Uh, it highlights the story of community, like I just said, uh, and our ability to like address social problems, which we think are due to unequal distribution of resources, which tend to lead to poverty, homelessness, unemployment, crime. Um, there were 39 authors. 40 authors, that should say 40 authors, or maybe we lost one. And there's 19 chapters covering a variety of topics. So the methods we used was just a survey that we sent out to students. Um, it had some questions like, how much did you learn about the field of community psychologies? Were you satisfied with the book? Do you see yourself using the material outside of the classroom? And uh, was it user-friendly? And then we had one 
open-ended qualitative questions. So this is a mixed method survey um, asking if there's anything else they want us to know about the book. And it's difficult to see the graphs, but I kind of explained them in the discussion section. So the first graph um, shows that roughly 87.7 respondents learned a lot or a tremendous amount. So a lot is the middle, tremendous amount is to the right uh, from this textbook. Uh, the second graph there, you know what I should also say that because of COVID and all that, um, we were unable to get more than 65 participants. And I completely understand because when I sent out the survey, um, it was very, the, the professors were very responsive. And they said, you know, we don't want to overburden our students with a bigger workload. So uh, next time when things settle down, we'd be happy to. And I had a lot of professors also email asking for links and test banks and lecture notes and slides so they could use the textbook in the future. So it's getting some support, um, which is nice. But at the current, we only had 65 participants. Third graph there is, uh, oh, one only, we had one person say that they were dissatisfied with the content of this book. And I went in to check if maybe they had left a reason for that in the qualitative number five question. And it turns out that one of our links was broken. So when you pressed it in the book, it wouldn't take you to the right source or it would just say page not found. So we immediately went in, changed the code for it, inserted the correct link, and that was resolved. So that was the one person, the 1.4% of the 65 who was dissatisfied with the content of the book. We found out why and we made the change. Third graph shows that a majority of textbook, textbook users found it to be user friendly. It's easy to navigate. Um, an example would be if there's a term or a concept or something that's difficult to understand, you press on it and it takes you to the definition of that word as we see it in community psychology. Uh, first order, second order change that we talked about in a previous workshop, those are examples of that. You would press it, it would define it for you, then you would just exit out of that screen and it would take you back to the book. So it was very easy to navigate. And based on this, most people thought so too. Uh, that, that's the third graph. Um, definitely mostly. And then a small portion said somewhat. Bottom graph um, is the fourth, which shows that most users would recommend this to others with only five participate, participants reporting that they maybe would report it to other users, but given the small sample size that we had and keeping that in mind uh, and everything I said, take that with a grain of salt, but it, it does look like students are genuinely enjoying this textbook. And uh, another thing, us as um, the editors or me as the evaluator, we're making the changes that the students are asking for. We're not just like dismissing them as not being valid. We're going right in, changing things, looking to analyze the data to see how they think. So uh, the last thing I want to talk about is the QR code. So if you don't have this textbook, feel free to pick up your cell phone, put your camera on, take a picture of the QR code uh, just with your camera. And if you do that, a link will show up and allow you to download the book straight to your phone for free. And I guess if you like what you see and you're an educator, feel free to reach out to me or any of the open access community psychology textbook people, which would be Dr. Jason, Dr. Glansman, uh, Jack O'Brien, myself, uh, for the test banks, lecture notes, and slides, so you can use it in your class as well. We'd be happy to provide that. Um, thank you for listening and thank you for sharing the time. That's all. Thank you, Ted. Uh, next, we have um, suicide among African-American children. Are the panelists here? They might have just joined and I haven't promoted them yet. So hold on just a second. Okay. 
Who are the presenters? This Matt, this um, Yeah, Simone. I just promoted Simone. Hi. Hello. 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 Okay. So this is our poster on um, suicide among African American children. Uh, so rates of suicide have increased on all accounts of race and age over the past decades, especially for African American children in this five to 12 year old range. However, uh, research really has focused on white Americans and middle to older adolescents, which has really resulted in assessments for suicidality and mental illness targeting these populations. So as you can see in this chart under our data section, in the 90s, death by suicide for five to 12 year olds was really similar by race. And over the 2000s, while both have increased, uh, especially African Americans, there's been a huge spike in the last few years as well. And really we think that this disparity between white and black suicides, especially in this age range, might be even greater than as the data presents because African-American children suicides are a lot more likely than whites to be misclassified as accidents. Additionally, African-Americans exhibit suicidal behaviors differently than whites. So for example, African-Americans are much more likely to carry out suicidal behaviors without previously voicing a plan, and they're a lot more likely to have undiagnosed or misdiagnosed mental health issues. We also found that children exhibit suicidal behaviors differently. For example, while in older adolescents and adults, the primary mental illness related to suicide is depression. For children, suicide might be more related to impulsivity, as research has found that the primary mental disorder is ADHD. So kind of in combination and together, these unique characteristics of suicide ideation and behaviors for this demographic can really result in errors in the data, as well as assessments that fail to properly identify African-American children's risk for suicide. So some previously identified um, protective factors for African-American adolescents um, include SES factors, community um, social support, personal factors, religious engagement, and familial support and relationships. Um, however, like Simone mentioned, a lot of the research is focused on that older range, um, about 12 to 15. And so it's a lot harder to find out how these um, factors kind of impact younger children, also how they interact with one another. For instance, how community factors could impact um, you know, one's access to, to certain community resource. And so we really need more res um, research on the impact of these factors on younger children, also how they interact with one another. Um, as for risk factors, um, African-American children are disproportionately impacted by environmental stressors that have been previously linked with mental illness and suicidality. Um, some of these include poverty, um, community violence, adverse childhood experiences, and experiences with racism and discrimination. Um, some studies found that African-American caregivers were more hesitant to seek help for their children and expressed greater doubt that treatment would help. Um, and research found that this might be rooted in um, cult, like medical distrust due to um, historical traumas committed against the Black community by the medical community, as well as individual experiences with racism and discrimination by medical providers that might make people less likely to want to go to them in the future and less trusting in the future. Um, there was also some research on the beliefs and um, expectations of students and how that could impact um, their ability to seek help. And some students reported really not knowing where to go for help, reported not wanting to get in parents involved or adults involved because it would seem too formal. And so some interventions that could be targeted at youth to help them identify risk in themselves and others and provide resources with where they could go with concerns um, could be really useful. There's also a lot of research about the impacts of racism and discrimination, um, exposure to both racism and discrimination, including some of the you know, police violence videos. These have been linked with PTSD symptoms and increased risk of suicide, um, behavior, suicidal behaviors and thoughts in African-American youth. So really there's just a need for more research overall in this area, especially as far as assessments and data collection go. Um, without proper screening and data, this problem can really appear minimized and it can be difficult to develop targeted interventions. Additionally, more research is needed on the predisposing risk and protective factors, resources for mental health services and utilization, as well as just developing culturally and socially relevant interventions. And as this quote in the box um, really hones in on, we need a really more a nuanced understanding of um, 
suicidal behavior among this population because the research just isn't there for this younger age group and we need to really understand some of the, the nuances around um, suicidal risk. Um, so this would allow us to create assessments and interventions that would more accurately assess risk and provide appropriate help. And without more research on this issue, um, the numbers may continue to rise as they have for 30 years. Thank you. Uh, thank you, guys. Thank um, you. Next, we have um, Sulio de Mama. Uh, moving from community assessment to action. Uh, are the panelists, um, the presenters, are they here? Lisa? Yes. No. Hello? Yeah, you're good to go. Okay, fantastic, thank you. Okay, so hello all, I'm pleased to actually be at NPA today. I know that we can't meet face to face, but this is at least something uh, as close as we can get. My name is Ian Turnbell. I'm a soon-to-be second-year doc student studying counseling psychology at Marquette University. Uh, Dr. Lisa Edwards is my advisor and the director of the Culture and Wellbeing Research Lab at Marquette as well. While the team cannot be in full to present today, I'm at least excited to tell you about the project and focusing on moving from community assessment to actual action in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So a little bit about the background, the rationale for their projects have to do with the concerning rates and consequences of perinatal mental health disorders, specifically looking into the impact that these mental health concerns have upon women in uh, pregnancy in the postpartum period. Most commonly, we do discuss postpartum depression. Among Latina moms, we know between one in four and maybe as little as one in six mothers will have some type of perinatal mental health concern, again, which most commonly is postpartum depression that can also include you know, anxieties and things like that. In specific interest, we have the consequences experienced by mothers and their children as a result of these concerns, such as atypical fetal development, birth complications, decreased maternal attachment to the child, issues. Two, Latina moms face quite a few um, barriers when it comes to their experience and also the impact of perinatal mental health concerns, such as their ability to get support by means of transportation, as well as the absence of readily available bilingual clinicians, especially um, at the clinic that we had been at in Milwaukee. Latina moms have many unique issues related to the stigma of mental illness, which is prevalent throughout mental health, um, but especially so within the Latinx community and Latina moms, as well as low income, poverty, insurance, uh, citizenship status and documentation status, as well as traumatic, uh, traumatic migration experiences to the United States. So a little bit about, about the process. In order to best serve Latina mothers and address the perinatal mental health, a community assessment known as Proyecto Mama was developed to evaluate the resources and needs of mothers. It involved the development of a task force of community members, the creation of an asset map, which you can see on the bottom right hand side of the page, as well as numerous interviews and focus groups with local healthcare providers, mothers, and faith leaders in the greater Milwaukee area. Findings actually revealed a multitude of barriers to accessing mental health care, mental health care for Latina moms during the perinatal period and a need for programs and services specifically tailored to these women's unique cultural experiences and their backgrounds. Specifically, support groups for perinatal mothers were noted as a desired community intervention. So kind of within this, uh, we'll talk a little bit about Circulo de la Mas um, and why it was developed. So these findings led to the development of Circulo de la Mas, which is a group for Spanish-speaking Latina mothers who either are pregnant or have had the baby within the last 12 months. Circulo de Milas is in collaboration with a large health clinic in Milwaukee, which serves a primarily Latinx population and also offers behavioral health and midwife services. They also have many Spanish clinicians, one of the few places in town that actually does. This group is facilitated by Dr. Lisa Edwards, who is a bilingual and bicultural psychologist. Recruitment included flyers as well as word of mouth. The, uh, the group met weekly for about 1.5 hours in total over 15 weeks. Mothers discussed topics of interest, family, general well-being and wellness during this perinatal period. 
a weekly assessment of individual levels of loneliness, anxiety, depression, social support, as well as group satisfaction took place during each meeting. At the moment, the group is on hold due to COVID-19. When looking at past data, a total of eight participants attended between as few as one and as many as 15 total group sessions. Seven mothers were pregnant during this period while one was postpartum. Four of them spoke Spanish only while three were bilingual. Mothers also reported agreement to stronger agreement on a scale about the utility of the group, increased support, decreased loneliness, and decreased depressive feelings. Qualitatively, mothers stated the group meetings provided them with a place to share their feelings, to laugh and talk, in addition to providing them with a chance to connect with other Latina moms. So moving on a little bit to this discussion. So Circulo de Mamas provides us with an example of how to take data from a community assessment and put it towards community action. Early analysis suggests the group is helpful by improving social support and connection with other Latina moms in the community. Once we will be able to resume services in the clinic, we hope to continue and gather additional data. So just some uh, final points as we finish this presentation. I just wanted to suggest some, some points of reflection, um, items such as positionality, um, listening, building teams, using data, those type of things. Um, for those who integrate, excuse me, for those who choose to integrate assessment findings and consider action, we also have a copy of the asset map, again, um, as seen below, and invite any questions that you might have. Thank you for your time and interest in the initiative. Thank you, man. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, next, um, growth focus activity in NMRS, uh, an academic outcome among Latinx index. I'm sorry, adolescents. Uh, Alexandra? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm on a very small uh, laptop, so <laughs> that's all right. I have to navigate from you know. Can you see your PowerPoint like this? I mean, your poster. I can see it. Yeah, I've got it pulled up on my computer too. So, all right. Okay. Please. With that. Okay. Hi everyone. Happy to be here. Um, it's kind of difficult designing a poster for virtual conference, but here we go. Um, I'm going to be presenting the results of a brief quantitative investigation of natural mentoring relationships, um, intrinsic motivation, and how that relates, or how stress is related to that among Latinx adolescents. So for some background, um, Latinx adolescents are among the fastest growing youth populations in the United States, um, and they disproportionately face systemic barriers such as discrimination, acculturation, and income-related stress. And for these reasons, they could benefit from um, high quality natural mentoring relationships. For some context, natural mentoring relationships are, um, we define them as youth-driven, organically formed relationships that typically arise from youth existing social circles, or you know they might find them in school or just places where they hang out. Um, some large-scale quantitative investigations have found that social support in natural mentoring relationships have been associated with better attitudes towards school, higher academic engagement, and higher intrinsic academic motivation. And finally, um, several studies have also demonstrated a negative relationship between academic stress and intrinsic motivation. So the participants we used in our study were Latinx students from two high schools in Chicago. They were surveyed at two time points in ninth grade and 10th grade, 54% female, 15 years old on average. And the ones used in this investigation were ones who reported at least one natural mentoring relationship and had completed all their uh, uh, responses on the the measures that we looked at in this study. So we define natural mentoring relationships. Um, we asked participants to respond yes or no to the question, is there anyone in your life age 18 or older who is more experienced than you and you go to for support and guidance? This person is not a parent or the person who raised you or a boy or girlfriend. This person is someone who you can count on to be there for you, who believes in you and cares deeply about you, who inspires you to do your best and who has really influenced what you do and the choices you make. And participants who responded yes to that question then went on to fill out the um, mentoring relationship quality questionnaire. So for the predictors, um, as far as measure, measuring instrumental relationship quality, we looked at the instrumental broad scale of the youth mentoring survey. A sample item from that is I want my important adult to help me do better at school. 
and just broadly instrumental quality has to do with tangible supports related to academics and learning that um, a youth might pick up in a mentoring relationship. Uh, measuring stressors, we looked at the multicultural event schedule and um, we looked at specifically school related stressors in this case. So a sample item from that is you did poorly on an exam or school assignment. And this also includes um, conflicts with teachers or maybe school administrators. The outcome variable intrinsic academic motivation was the intrinsic motivation scale, which includes three subscales, challenge, curiosity, and independent mastery. So I conducted a hierarchical multiple regression. For that, the results are probably a little hard to see on the right there, but um, I entered intrinsic motivation in ninth grade, um, just to control for that effect um, in 10th grade. So we were looking for a longitudinal effect here. And then in the second step, I entered instrumental natural, natural mentoring relationship quality and school related stress, found that instrumental quality um, predicted higher intrinsic motivation. And then in the third step, I entered the interaction between school stress and natural mentoring relationship quality. School stress did not predict um, uh, intrinsic motivation independently, but there was a significant interaction between school stress and mentoring relationship quality. The interaction effect is plotted below that table there. Um, and basically what we found is that um, youth with lower school related stress had a stronger effect of instrumental relationship quality on intrinsic motivation. And that is the, the green line there, if that's visible. And basically what this tells us is that tangible social support from important adults uh, might be better received when youth are less stressed um, when it comes to school. So if people are interested in, in engaging in mentoring relationships or have a youth that they work with or a family member, um, it's also important to address any school related stressors that come up in order for any tangible supports that that you might offer them offer them uh, to be effective. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Next, we have uh, schools use of technology to screen youth at risk for suicide. Um, Chelsea is Chelsea around? Yeah. Good, good, good. You have the floor. Perfect. So hello everyone. My name is Chelsea and I'm a research project coordinator at DePaul's Community Research Center. And I, along with Sean, who's a doctoral student in DePaul's Community Psychology Program, will be presenting our poster on how schools use of technology to screen youth at risk for suicide. Um, for this poster, we were really interested in exploring how technology can help youth at risk for suicide get access to support and resources. So although suicide is the second leading cause of death among high school age adolescents, very few youth receive any mental health care. In fact, one study found that less than half of the youth they identified as having a current mental or behavioral diagnosis had received any treatment for it within the past year. One tool we have that may help bridge the gap between needing mental health care and accessing mental health care are schools. Not only do schools have unique access to large numbers of youth, but schools are already the entryway to mental or behavioral services for most youth. However, the reactive methods that schools typically rely upon to identify youth in need of services results in the most disruptive youth getting the additional support, youth with internalizing issues that are, are often overlooked. So one approach for improving identification of youth with suicidal thoughts and behaviors is through school-wide screenings. Some prior studies have questioned the sustainability of these types of programs, mainly because of the additional resources required to ensure a school-wide screening program is successful. However, with the aid of technology, school-wide screenings may be less cumbersome and easier to implement than previously thought. So for example, technology can be used to send out and track suicide screeners. So using a secure web app, the chosen validated screener can be easily programmed. This includes setting up automatic and immediate notifications to appropriate staff when a youth is flagged for a same-day follow-up. The results can also be quickly downloaded into a simple spreadsheet to track youth requiring continued monitoring. The advantages of this method is it increases the efficiency and saves administrative time through better tracking methods, automatic scoring, and immediate flagging and notifications. And the app only needs to be programmed once and then can be used year after year and even shared between schools. All right, thank you, Chelsea. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, so as Chelsea described, um, web-based web screening uh, among school-age youth represents a potentially powerful tool in the identification and management of suicidal ideation. Um, however, as is the case with any emergent uh, methodology, there will be challenges that need to be addressed. Uh, first and foremost, the tools where these platforms are maintained must be evaluated for readiness. Um, based on the specific resources an institution has at their disposal, it may be necessary to tailor the suicide 
um, ideation screening program to suit these characteristics. And it's the hope that through collaboration with community providers and researchers that these ends may be achieved. Um, additionally, web-based platforms that undoubtedly raise concerns uh, regarding privacy and data security, particularly in spaces where the data of interest may be considered particularly sensitive. Um, uh, certain protections, including encrypted passwords and restricted access, can help ensure that these sensitive data would be protected. Um, beyond the logistics, an additional obstacle is the consideration of providing timely and efficient mechanisms for follow-up assessment. Uh, best practices for screening process include, include conducting warning screenings and setting a cap on the number of screens conducted per day. Um, in the assessment phase, uh, schools may not be equipped to review the screening results, provide additional assessment, and initiate proper discourse and treatment. Um, as such, school psychologists and counselors may be presented with professional development training opportunities, which are readily available online. Um, as a new tool used in the assessment of youth suicidal ideation, it will be definitely essential that this methodology undergo a rigorous evaluation process. I'm Sean, uh, yeah. by any chance, can you move? A little bit closer to your mic. We are. Uh, I'm sure the audience cannot uh, hear you very well. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Uh, sure, I'm sorry. Um, Thank you. So, uh, as a new tool in the assessment of youth su suicidal ideation, it will be essential that this methodology undergo a rigorous evaluation process uh, to ensure its validity, reliability, and cost effectiveness. Um, it will also be crucial to identify and resolve the unique contextual population characteristics, uh, which facilitate the effectiveness of web screening. Um, in closing, uh, schools provide a unique and ideal setting for uh, the screening of youth suicidal ideation. Um, web screening has the benefit of streamlining the identification process and increasing sustainability of these important early intervention strategies for those who make a difference. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have uh, open collaboration and open access. The online textbook creation process. Um, Jack? You have the floor. I'm not seeing Jack here. I just saw Oya uh, enter and I just promoted her. Okay, is Oya available? She should be right now, yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, hi, everyone. Hi. Sorry. Um, yeah, Jack just texted me and said he's been having a hard time uh, getting into the session. So I'm happy to start. And if Ted is on, Ted, feel free to jump on with me. I think you need to raise your hand. So we're going to... I am on. Super. Um, so hello, everyone. We're really excited to be presenting kind of the processes behind the open collaboration uh, in creating the open access uh, textbook, uh, Introduction to Community Psychology Becoming an Agent of Change, which was published uh, last year. Um, as Ted mentioned, this is the same textbook that he was um, evaluating. It is technically tailored for undergraduate students. However, it can really be used by anyone who is interested in learning about the field um, and one of the goals that, that we had in mind when, when we were putting together this text is raising awareness about the field and at the same, same time bringing it to the forefront of online learning. As you know, especially if you are in academia, but um, even if you're not, you probably understand that there are uh, barriers to completing college education for many students, especially those who are, um, um, have been historically marginalized, including um, housing, tuition, you know, and textbook costs, among many others. And this has only been ex exacerbated by um, the COVID-19 pandemic. So we truly believe that, first of all, knowledge should be free, but also that online education resources can help reduce those barriers to learning, as well as allow for more interactive engagement with material uh, and, and have you know, access be accessible to larger population. So some of the things that we truly believed in when we were working on this project is that you need to have a specific platform and you have to have expectations. And of course, ours where it needs to be free. 
both to create because we were working um, with minimal budget. So it, need, it needed to be um, sustainable to begin with so we can finish the project. It, it was a volunteer work um, on the behalf of editors as well as authors. And it needs to be free to be uh, accessible. So students should be able or whoever is accessing should be able to read it for free. And not just now, but you know, for, the, for the remaining uh, time. So we did not want to get stuck with a platform that will maybe at some point start charging uh, wh whoever is accessing the book. Uh, we also wanted to be capable of supporting the features that students uh, deemed important in an online text, like being able to highlight, being able to um, have embedded links um, and, and things along those lines. Um, we also needed a platform will, which will be able to provide support to us because this was the first time that we were creating something like this. Um, so we were successful thanks to a, a lot of uh, people who have come together and shared their knowledge and their time um, you know, and the effort that they put in. And so what the process looked like is that we actually really wanted it to be as collaborative and as participatory as possible. And so SCRA members, specifically members of the SCRAS listserv, were solicited um, and asked to, if they're interested in participating uh, in putting together the stacks. And so to continue with this participatory method, the content uh, was, in, was run by um, all of the authors as well as other members of the SCRA. So they had an input in which chapters are gonna be covered. Um, and then what we did is we, we kind of wanted this unified vision of the book across diverse backgrounds of the contributors because we wanted to show the diversity of our field. Um, at the same time, we needed consistency of the style and content level and readability, um, as well as trying to incorporate teaching aids and assessment instruments into the book. So we, we did think that it, it can be a standalone book to read, as well as used as a textbook uh, by instructors. Um, and then, of course, we needed to achieve that in a matter that was both logically feasible and economically viable. Um, so some of the ways that we did that is by setting um, author guidelines. We were not gonna lie, we had to adjust them along the way. Uh, this was a learning, a learning process for all of us. A lot of it was feedback from our authors and others involved on the project. Um, so you can kind of see some of the samples that, uh, of the guidelines that we, we have sent out to our um, contributors. For example, it was important to us that students can easily identify key terms, terms and concepts that we deemed important to our field. So it needed to be bolded as well as uh, have a definition attached uh, to it. So then when you hover over, you can see that. We also um, asked our contributors to make sure that there are practical applications in the textbook. So create boxes with practical application because our field is so applicable. Um, and then, uh, of course, we wanted it to be more of a down-to-earth conversation, writing style, as well as interactive. So in summary, um, in terms of the process, it was important for us to stay true to the values of our field, to be transparent and collaborative, as well as involve the audience in the process. We actually had undergraduate students involved with the book. Um, we had an editor who we have hired who was an undergraduate student to read through the textbook. Um, you know, so again, this involving those who will be using the product in the process. We also made sure to keep in mind the copyright so we don't break any laws uh, and keep in mind time and funding, which is also important. Um, so kind of to summarize even further, there are certain things that, that uh, were important to us, as you can see. So when you are creating something like this, um, you need to have a clear agenda and goals. Um, but also have a vision. And that vision in our case came true. So we are excited to know that our readership has definitely passed 2000 people. And this is just based on a research gate, which is only a sliver of the audience that has access um, to, to the textbook. Uh, many other platforms have um, ways of sharing it. And in fact, the book is shared in most other platforms. And unfortunately, we can't tell you all the numbers because not all of them are tracking it, but we know it's being used. Um, so there are a variety of textbook platforms that the book is being shared on. We know for a fact that it is used not just nationally, but also internationally. We, are, uh, we keep hearing from instructors anywhere from Bulgaria to Japan to Spain 
Canada and Australia, among others, and of course, um, across the United States as well. Um, so we have uh, leaders all over the world and we're really proud that we're able to kind of put this together. Um, Ted, did you wanna jump in? Really quickly, we had 19 countries that have been using or reading the book. Ted? We don't? I'm sorry, um, um, you, you guys uh, passed the, the time, like, like two minutes over. Uh, and so, so that I can give the other people the floor. Uh, you can put everything, any other thing you have in the comments, uh, chat and Sorry sections. You know, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Oya. Uh, next, uh, gender differences in suicide for African American adolescents. Um, Melinda? Yes. Hi. Can you hear me all right? Sure. Okay. Um, all right, so um, I'm Melinda. I'm a research assistant at the Center for Community Research. Um, and this poster is going to explore gender differences in suicide for African American adolescents. So I want to first start by uh, mentioning that African American adolescents in general are disproportionately affected by risk factors for suicide, such as poverty, racism, stigma and lack of access to mental health resources and that this is reflected in the fact that suicide rates for African American adolescents have been rising faster than adolescents of other racial and ethnic identities. Uh, so you'll notice that the graph here depicts serious injury from a suicide attempt in high schoolers. In 1991, the rates for black and white high schoolers were virtually the same, but by 2017, there is a noticeable uptick in the rate of black students compared to white students. Um, so within group differences also exist, um, most notably gender differences. So the gender differences in suicide are often discussed through the gender paradox of suicide, which is that girls have higher rates of ideation and attempts and boys have higher rates of suicide completion. Um, this is true for all races, but is especially extreme for African American adolescents, as you'll see in these two images on the right there. Um, so while researchers have proposed various potential explanations for this paradox, the one with the most research support is that boys tend to use more legal methods, such as firearms, while African American girls in particular use suffocation. So more of a breakdown of these methods by gender is shown in the pie charts right there. Um, so these different uh, other potential theories have been proposed, although with less empirical support. Um, but um, so it, the differences might be because of differences in access to firearms and because boys are more likely to participate in suicides that are impulsive, which have a greater chance of involving more violent means. Um, other theories uh, for, are that uh, since girls are socialized to be more relationship oriented and empathetic, they may consider protecting family or friends who find them from a more disturbing site. Um, also, because girls are more conscious of body image as a result of socialization, they may choose a method that does not leave them as disfigured. Um, on the other hand, boys may feel pressure to choose a method that will have a less likelihood of failure based on achievement socialization. Um, and then media portrayal also plays into that as well. Um, African American girls and boys also have different risk factors for suicide. So for example, as uh, anxiety as well as a combined effect from depression and cumulative trauma are pathways through which racial discrimination can lead to suicidality, particularly in African American girls. And um, being involved in delinquent behaviors, having weakened social supports from friends and parents, and having a peer with suicidal behavior are also risk factors that more commonly lead to suicide in girls, according to existing research. For boys, deindustrialization, stig stigma and safety concerns around expressing vulnerability, and decreased activity in church communities are more often documented as risk factors. Um, so on the other hand, for protective factors, uh, social relational factors and psychological well-being are more impactful for girls, while boys may be more influenced by academic protective factors for suicide. So overall, future research and intervention efforts should recognize and work hard to understand these gender differences to be able to implement um, 
solutions that will cater to them. So more effort should be put towards catching suicidal thoughts before they escalate and developing a very sensitive screening measures for suicidal thoughts and controlling gun access due to the disproportionate amounts of boys completing suicide. Um, so overall, it is imperative that we can get an even better understanding of how to be able to predict and understand suicidal trajectories for girls and boys because their lives quite literally depend on it. Um, so that's about it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have um, estimating the number of recovery residency in the United States. Um, Elizabeth? She wasn't able to make it, so she asked me to do the presentation. Uh, is this dead? You could leave my camera off or on, it doesn't matter, but when I click on video, it says I can't. No big deal. It's fine. Uh, can you see your posters? I can. I can. So let's roll through that. Uh, hi again, everyone. This time I'm wearing a, uh, talking about a different project. Uh, we had a dilemma uh, because we, at the Center for Community Research over at DePaul, uh, constantly uh, do research with Oxford House. And Oxford Houses are the, one of the nation's biggest uh, recovery home networks uh, providing care after care treatment for individuals struggling with substance use disorder. Uh, but the problem is uh, we don't know how many of these homes there are in the United States. So with that underlying uh, current, we decided that we would estimate the number of recovery residences in the United States. Um, there's roughly 3.8 million people who receive some sort of substance abuse treatment, and uh, that's data based on 2016. Um, the treatment costs uh, are responsible for 10.4% of the global burden, uh, which is higher than any chronic disease that combined. Uh, many individuals complete inpatient treatment or released back into the community, and they don't have the life skills not all of them, but most of them don't have the life skills to go back into the community because they haven't been taught anything. It's kind of like the jail recidivism kind of thing. You know, you go to jail, yeah, you're being punished, but did you learn anything about how to function in society? And that's what we want recovery homes to do. So I'm going to skip to the procedure section. So what we did to figure this thing out is we went in to find publicly available data uh, on four organizations. We did Oxford House, which keeps meticulous records, and they're really good about it. NAR, which is in second place, they're still under construction, so some states have really good records, others do not. SAMHSA, which is kind of uh, less restrictive on who gets to post there. There's a couple checkpoints in place for people to be able to post onto their website, but for the most part, they're um, they kind of allow people to post. And then the other one was Intervention America, where it's, those are the least restrictive. You just post your URL, you name your recovery home, you have an email address, they send you an email, you confirm it, done. Um, so the totals by state, as you can see, are in the middle. And uh, we had a little bit of an issue where some of the houses were falling in SAMHSA and they were falling in Intervention America. So we did a comparison of the two and eliminated the houses that were overlapped, so we weren't getting duplicates. Um, at the end of the day, after everything was said and done, we've estimated that there are nearly 18,000 recovery homes in the United States. Um, we checked this through. We also did some qualitative research where we called the presidents of NAR to see, we asked them two questions. How many houses are listed in your state? How many do you suspect are in your state that are not listed with your affiliation? And then we also took those percentages. We noticed that states where that had higher cities, uh, urban versus rural, urban had a lot more recovery homes. And that's just common sense, I think, at this point. Um, so 
broken down by organization, you can see that Oxford House had 2,355, NAR had 1,470, SAMHSA had 1,125, and Intervention America, the one that had no real um, overseeing body, they had no rules uh, or anything, they had almost 13,000. And uh, the problem with that is, right, we had some stories in the paper, but there's profiteers out there. And one profiteer uh, on the John Oliver Show even said that stop sending your recovering addicts to Florida because we end up sending them back in body bags. So the goal of this paper was to maybe get some type of overseeing body to see that people are not exploiting the people who are at their most vulnerable. Um, I could get into the discussion, but I think I kind of touched on the main importance of it, right? We, we would like to see an overseeing body to reduce profiteers, uh, to not exploit people when they're at their most vulnerable. Thank you, Ted. Uh, moving right along, um, there's, um, we have, when the servant serves the community, community involvement and um, ex Exaco 60, I believe, uh, Ryan. I'm not seeing anyone named Ryan. Pabalo, uh, Makati, Ferrari. Um, this poster is uh, from before, too. Right. If one of the presenters is here, could you please raise your hand? Doesn't look like they're here. I sent him a text message, but he hasn't replied. Uh, if he does, I'll let you know. Mm. Uh, do we want to move to the next slide? And um, if they jump in, uh, if there's still time down the road, we'll, we'll, we'll give them the opportunity to. Is, um, is Jamin from um, uh, Loyola here? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Ogechi or Cynthia, um, and I'll be presenting on behalf of our team at Loyola. Okay, uh, welcome. Thank you. Go for it. All right. Um, so hi everyone again, my name is Cynthia and I'm a doctoral student in the clinical psychology program at um, Loyola University of Chicago. And along with my colleagues, um, we will be presenting on um, experiences from our cross-age peer mentoring intervention that we've had with working with community collaborators. Um, and the literature just suggests that um, surrounding the host of advantages with working with community collaborators, specifically for community-based interventions, these projects are more likely to find sustained success um, with community members as being part of the service and research team, um, including but not exempt to ecological validity, um, including participatory methods that enrich both the research, but also making sure that the participants in the research are being well representative um, and making sure that the research is rich and um, accurate in what it's meant to portray. Portraying. Um, however, there is some tension that lies between research and practice that may present challenges. Um, so interventions that are community-based um, are suggest that it can be more effective um, by including community collaborators in a sensitive way um, that is respective of all stakeholders and parties. Specifically, interventions such as cross-age peer mentoring um, can be an effective method of promoting positive development and presenting problems, behaviors among youth, particularly youth um, from urban environments that are experiencing chronic levels of stress. Um, and doing so in a community-based manner is advantageous in that way. Um, so to kind of get started, I'll just give a brief background on the project. So Saving Lives Inspiring Youth was a four-year longitudinal um, project examining the efficacy of cross-age peer mentoring and reducing negative outcomes related with violence exposure for high-risk Latinx and Black youth. Um, it was facilitated by the Risk and Resilience Lab and the Empowering Counseling Program at Loyola. 
and community partnerships were established to recruit high school mentors and elementary and um, middle school mentees in after school mentoring programming and supervising the mentoring relationships. And over the course of the project, um, over 300 mentors and mentees were serviced in nine different mentoring sites across four low income high crime communities in Chicago between 2015 and 2018. Um, so in order to facilitate these mentoring interventions, we relied heavily on our community partners and um, understood um, the importance of doing community-based work as well as um, community-based participatory action research. Um, so today I'll just be presenting two different community, uh, two different community collaborations at two different sites, um, but acknowledging that some of our collaborations presented with a host of successes and were easy to facilitate and some were more challenging with some obstacles and how our research team and staff helped address those. So starting off, um, I'll go over, thank you, um, with Hickamore Elementary, which was a mentoring site in a low SES high crime community in Chicago's West Side. Um, there was a host of challenges that we faced, including scarcity of, of resources, community mistrust, um, exploitation from the research team, and um, misconceptions about our Black and Latinx high school students who were coming in um, to mentor the elementary schools at that site. However, in order to address some of those challenges, we established relationships with a diverse array of community collaborators. So not only um, the community organization that we were a part of, but also school staff and administration and developed weekly meetings to collaborate with um, the collaborators to address challenges and then had mentors design and formulate plans to facilitate these conversations, which aided to be successful. Um, at Nightingale Elementary, which was another mentoring site in a similar um, context background, our community collaborations were more successful and that Community collaborations were initiated at the start of the programming. They were invited into sessions to observe and participate in discussion activities when appropriate, um, which pr promoted participatory elements. They were invited to work on research projects and um, papers, and also SLI staff and researchers rejected notions of elitism that was often associated with outside researchers and instead relied on the expertise of the community collaborators and expressed genuine care and concern for the community. Um, so all in all, an effective strategy in having community collaborations um, with our partners included um, increasing transparency between the community collaborators, collaborators, the research staff, and the youth mentors, and it remains imperative to meet community collaborators' fears and resistance with understanding, compassion, and willingness to meet them where they're at, and doing so can foster dialogue around all stakeholders um, to discover and build upon strengths and the benefits of productive teamwork. Thank you, Cynthia. I mean, thank you. Um, thank you. Ogechi, right? Thank you. <laughs> Next, uh, we have our community academic collaborative addresses cancer disparity in Chicago Latinx community. Gina? It says I can't turn on my video, but that's fine. Um, so hi, I'm Gina Curry. I am the uh, director of the Office of Community Engagement and Cancer Health Equity um, at the University of Chicago Medicine Comprehensive Cancer Center. I'm also a doctoral student at the National Lewis Community Psychology Program. And I'm gonna be talking about um, a community academic collaboration to address cancer disparities in the Latinx community. Um, what my office does is that we are on the university side, so we do the research, we work with the cancer investigators and uh, physicians that conduct uh, cancer-focused research. Um, a lot of times when we're in the community, we're asked for, clinical, asked for clinical help and we can refer um, patients to the clinical side, to the hospital side, but our focus is community-engaged research. And so that is what my office has been tasked with. Um, we chose to uh, work with the South Chicago community because I already had um, existing um, partnerships there, relationships there that I had been uh, building over the past 10 years. So it was easier to go to a community um, that you already have a partnership with. Um, I want to acknowledge that uh, this part of the um, 
um, collaboration was the heavy lifting was pretty much done by our uh, public health students at Chicago State University. Um, they, it was part of their 180 hour practicum uh, graduation requirement for their degree. Um, I developed a pipeline between Chicago State University and the University of Chicago Cancer Center to give exposure to minority students at less resourced um, universities to just give them that kind of exposure and that experience at a major medical academic research institution. And um, all of the feedback about the um, pipeline has been very positive, so we're gonna continue that pipeline program. Um, so what we did was listening sessions, um, and again, the students conducted the listening sessions with Latinx uh, community members that were cancer survivors, can caregivers, or um, cancer-focused community organizations. Um, and from um, the methods that we used was community-based participatory research approach. We also used the um, a ABCD approach, the asset-based community development approach. And from the listening sessions, um, the feed that we, we got was that there was just a general um, lack of knowledge about the resources um, in the community, lack of financial and some, uh, emotional support and concerns about excessive pollution, and also a lot of concern about the disinvestment of the city and government for that part of um, the city. And so um, one of the things that came up through just collaborative conversations was that there was a YMCA, um, South Chicago YMCA, that had um, closed down and they had just bought it back and they said, well, we have an empty room. Can we turn that into a cancer resource center? So that just shows the collaborative power of a community. They have a space, they have a building, they just need contact content and experts. So we made sure that, you know, we could provide resources in Spanish and English around cancer. We uh, collaborated with organizations like Wellness House to provide chair yoga and um, things like uh, meditation and mindfulness. And then we would have some of the um, oncologists from the University of Chicago, we could have them come and do lunch and learns and um, on topics just around, you know, cancer one-on-one -on -one screening events, uh, risk reduction. Um, and survivorship. And so out of the, um, an, another major theme of the um, focus or the listening sessions was that they wanted a community specific resource guide. So that's what you see the second picture in the middle was a resource guide that was translated into Spanish. The front cover are actual murals, pictures of murals from the community. So when, they, when the community members see that, they know that this is from their community. And, um, and they collaborated and, and they told us everything they wanted inside of the resource guide. So some of the next steps that we are um, doing is that we're going to take that um, resource guide and have it put into a uh, app so people can just download it from their smartphones. Um, we have already actually established the Latinx Cancer Control Task Force and um, we are going to apply for a mini grant that just you know makes our collaboration stronger and stronger we're in our second year and um, all of this is responses to what the community wanted we haven't asked them for anything we haven't done anything around um, research cancer research all of this is building just collaboration that is a genuine relationship and it's just not the university always going to the community asking for things thank you Thank you, Gina. Um, I'm sorry you couldn't share your video. Um, I was sharing the PowerPoint, so thank you. Yeah, that was fine. 